Hello everyone, and today we are talking about Netflix front-end system design. We'll start from functional and non-functional requirements. Then we will talk about data flow, components and interfaces, and accessibility and performance. The first requirement is video playback. Play, pause, fast-forward functionalities with support for HD, Full HD, and Ultra HD. Next one is automatic video quality adjustment based on the viewer's internet speed. Then search functionality with filters like gender, actors, and release date. Next one is recommendations based on user preferences and viewing history. The next one is supporting for multiple audio tracks in different languages. And users and share what they are watching, plus rate on end. From non-functional requirements, we'll talk about performance, accessibility, internationalization, and scalability. Now let's talk about data flow. The client represents the user's device, such as a web browser, mobile app, or smart TV application, which users use to interact with the video streaming service. The client sends a request to the API gateway for actions like fetching video data, user orientation, or requesting a video stream. For requests involving user data or video metadata, the API gateway varies the database to retrieve or update the required information. For new video uploads, the API gateway sends the video to the Transodin service. The Transodin service processes the video into multiple formats suitable for various devices and network speeds. Once the Transodin process is complete, the multiple versions of the video are uploaded to the storage service, such as AWS. The storage service then makes this video available to the CDN for aging. The CDN stores copies of the video, especially the most popular ones, to serve them weekly to clients upon request. If a video stream is requested, the API gateway checks if the video is available on the CDN. If the video is aged on the CDN, especially for popular videos, the CDN sends the video to the client from the closest server location, optimizing for speed and reducing latency. This reduces the need to fetch the video from the storage service. It was a basic and potential data flow. Now let's talk about some examples. If we have one video file, size let it be 1 GB and 100 users, Transaudient cost will be $4.5 for Transaudient 1 hour of video into 3 formats. Storage cost will be around 4 cents per month for storing 1 GB video in S3 standard. Streaming cost will be $9 per month for S3 data transfer and eight and half per month dollars for CDN delivery to 100 users. Total cost will be around $22 and four cents per month for uploading, storing, transporting, and streaming the video to 100 users. So this price is just entry point. We don't take into account developing, monitoring, etc. But at least we have some basic understanding how it works and how much it cost. Before we dive into discussing components, let's first look at the pages we have. The first page handles sign in or sign up and includes a lot of SEO friendly content to make it easy for people to find. After sign in, users are taken to the main page where they can search for any movie they want to watch. This page is organized by different groups. Users can scroll to the right to find additional movies or scroll down to explore more groups. When a user hovers over a video, a trailer will play in the video section. If a user clicks on a genre or types something into the search bar, they will see a similar page but with search results or video related to this group. Finally, if a user clicks on a video, they are taken to the video component to watch it. And after watching, they enrate the video.
Now let's look at the main components we'll use. We'll also use other main interfaces needed for each page. On the first page there is a lot of SEO data, and users can also sign in or sign up. The first interface we need is for the user, which includes fields like ID, name and preferences. User preferences are set when they read their profile, allowing them to choose from a list of options before they start using the service. Additionally, we can read some data while users are already using the app. We include options for language, quality, genre and accessibility in the user interface to improve our recommendations and user experience. To display the second page of movies we need to fetch more data. Movies are organized by genre, with each genre having its own group of movies. Each movie is represented by an image. When you hover over the image a trailer video plays, along with additional information about the movie. To avoid loading all data at once and optimize performance, we use pagination. This means we don't fetch all movies at once, which prevents having too much data on the page. Instead, as we scroll down or to the right, we fetch more data as needed. The question is, should we use offset-based pagination or cursor-based pagination? Offset-based pagination uses offset and limit in the database query. Offset tells us how many records to skip, while limit specifies the maximum number of records to return. Cursor-based pagination uses a unique cursor to fetch the next set of results. Instead of an offset, the cursor identifies where to start the next page. Both methods have their pros and ons. Since we expect to have a small number of genres and the data doesn't change freely, offset based pagination is simple and effective for our needs. First, we fetch a list of genres, and then we need to get movies for each group. This can get a bit complex if we have many endpoints just to show movies. Instead, we can use GraphQL. GraphQL is powerful for fetching data because it allows clients to request exactly what they need. This flexibility helps us to avoid both overfetching and underfetching which are common issues with traditional REST API. However, when scrolling through a specific group of movies, we still use REST API. If we type something in the search bar, we use a search endpoint with pagination as well. And if we click on a movie, we navigate to the movie page, which has another specific endpoint to fetch detailed data. A video component uses a link to show the video. It's a URL that grants temporary access to a specific resource. The URL is signed in with a secret E and has expiration time. The API gateway generates this URL with parameters that might include the movie ID, user ID, and an expiration timestamp. Once the URL expires, it can no longer be used to access the video content. If we want to share the video, we can put the ID of the movie to the URL. And if user is eligible to open our service, the link will be opened. Let's get back to our CQL link options. We have two ways to use this link. Simple URL with REST API. This option uses a RESTful API to provide a direct URL to a video file. This URL will be a pre sign in URL for CU access, which is usually valid for a limited time. This link typically points to a single, non-adaptive video stream. This method has its pros and cons. HLS and Dash. These are protocols designed for adaptive bitrate streaming. They break down video content into small chunks and use a manifest file to list these chunks. This approach also comes with its own set of advantages and disadvantages. If you need a weak and straightforward solution for short videos 
or situations when non-adagio streaming is sufficient, the first option is better, it's simpler and easy to implement. However, if you want to provide a high quality, adaptive streaming experience that adjusts to users' network conditions and scale for a large audience, HLS or Dash, is the better choice. Based on these points, it seems that HLS or Dash would be the most suitable option. Use HLS when you mainly target Apple devices, need simpler integration or via strong DRM, and native support on iOS, macOS. Use Dash if you aim to reach a wider range of devices beyond Apple's ecosystem, need more flexibility in others, want advanced streaming features, or plan to optimize bandwidth for complex streaming scenarios. Dash is also a good choice when working with open standards. Let's break down to the main accessibility and performance requirements for our streaming service to ensure it's inclusive and efficient. Accessibility is crucial to making sure everyone can enjoy our content, regardless of their abilities or devices. Here are the most important accessibility features to implement. Most critical accessibility features are able support, alt description, contrast them, options, and subtitles. Optimizing performance is very important for providing a smooth user experience. Here are the most important performance considerations. Most critical features are virtual scrolling and lazy loading. Use virtual scrolling and lazy loading to manage large list of content efficiently, only load the elements currently visible on the screen, and unload them when they are out of view. HLS and Dash for video streaming Utilizing HLS or Dash protocols to stream video in small chunks. This approach ensures that video playback starts weekly and adapts to the user's network conditions providing a buffer-free viewing experience. That's all for today's video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. See you next time. Bye.